Thanks, Sophie. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I, I've decided to take um, a historical approach to this problem because I think, especially in science actually, the, it's quite hard to get a sense of time. And time's a really important theme, I think, for this meeting. It's about the time that patients have, how critical that time is. It's about the pace of change, and it's about the adaptation to that change in the system to try and bring those two timelines together in a way that meets patients' needs. And um, so <clears throat> it's going to, I'm calling this a brief history of cancer, but it's also, like you could say, its subtext is reason and hope. So it should be obvious um, to everybody that humans, uh, cancer's been around at least as long as humans have been around. Um, <clears throat> there's a picture of Pythagoras on your right. The gentleman on the left had an osteosarcoma in his spine. We know that because in the mummy, mummified skeleton you could see the presence of the tumor. This is not something that is new. It's been an ancient curse of mankind. I'm uh, hopeful that mankind's fundamental design faults won't persist into the future, but I'm optimistic. I believe uh, Graham is, I hope he's right about being able to eradicate this, this ancient disease. There are three ages in the way that we've thought about cancer. And the first age, which goes back before the Christian era, really up until the middle of the 19th century, is the anatomic age. And it's all based around, you know, you'd be surprised, but based around basic research into anatomy. You see a picture of Vesalius there on the left, um, uh, and you can see on the right the application of an anatomic knowledge about the human, uh, uh, human, uh, the human being that was used by William Halstead in the bottom of the right, um, to treat effectively breast cancer. You see a mammogram there of a breast cancer. It was the use of anatomic concepts of cancer that resulted in the development of curative approaches for this very common disease. And even today, as Graham pointed out, surgery is still fundamental and will be fundamental to cure of these diseases, I think, going forward. So anatomy has been the initial phase. Where an organ is, uh, where the tumor arises, that's how we define that cancer. It is a breast cancer, no matter what sort of histology it is. It is a lung cancer and so forth. The second great era of uh, understanding of cancer has been about, it's about 150, 160 years of age, and it depended upon the light microscope. Because for the first time, when people look down the microscope, they saw this astonishing complexity. What they thought was a lump, in fact, was composed of these tiny cells. Uh, there are a billion cells and a teaspoon of, a, of any cancer, as I tell the patients that I see when I, when I try to explain to them what the sort of diseases they face. And it's actually looking at that light microscopic appearance that is the basis for the way in which we currently treat cancers. For example, if I treat an osteosarcoma, a cancer of the bone, or a Ewing sarcoma, another cancer of the bone, it's their light microscopic differences which determine how we treat those diseases in every possible way. Because we know that osteosarcoma is a disease that is predominantly localized. You can remove the tumor and cure, and cure people, and you can use chemotherapy to do that. Something like Ewing sarcoma, also a cancer of bone, looks different under the light microscope. They're called small round blue cell tumors. That's very scientific. It's called a small round blue cell tumor. We treat completely differently because we know those cells spread early and wide. Now that's not reason, that's empiric observation. That is 150 years of painstaking work mapping what these things look like under the microscope against how they behave and then empirically testing the drugs that we have used to try and cure patients. Incredibly important as you'll come when I do at the end, I'm gonna wrap up by describing how much change has occurred over the past 40 or 50 years as a result of use of these technologies and through clinical research. But we're in the third great era of cancer, which is driven by the idea that genes determine the behavior of uh, cancers, that they're essentially a genetic disease. And this picture of uh, James Watson and Francis Crick posing after their publication, their seminal publication in the prestigious Journal of Na Nature in 1953, describing for the first time the molecular structure of DNA sequences, DNA that provides the, the blueprint that describes everything about every person in this room, every living organism, and it includes everything about the way or, uh, in which, it, it, from, for all intents and purposes, cancers behave. Now, Cancers are no doubt incredibly complex, and each of us, each of our cells contains six billion uh, nucleotides of that DNA. 
in a, like, think of it like an encyclopedia with letters and sentences that are six billion letters long that tell us who we are and how we behave. So we were able to understand the concepts in 1953, but being able to reduce that to a model for cancer really has taken the past 60 or so years. Peter Noel, um, a great researcher who described the first visible cancer mutation in the early 1960s, published this seminal uh, uh, model for cancer, which I think holds true today, that you start off with a normal cell, as you can see in this picture, and it divides, and in the course of its division, it acquires a mutation that changes its code and changes fundamentally its behavior. And eventually, by random chance, it acquires enough of these changes that the cancer grows independently and ultimately it becomes the thing that kills people. And that is probably a reasonable model for cancer to this day. Now, because there are six billion positions at which you can get changes, cancers are often overwhelmingly complex structures. And really, I think it's only been in the past 10 or so years that we've developed the tools to tackle this problem in an absolutely comprehensive way. And that's what's changed uh, dramatically. The, the game is changing from a point where we can see hints and glimpses of this thing to being able to tackle it comprehensively. This machine, the HiSeqX, came out, uh, was released publicly in the world in, uh, on January 14, 2014, 18 months ago. Are you getting the hint about the subtext of time? You're talking about hundreds of years down to 150 years down to 40 years, down to the development of technologies that allow the deconvolution of those six billion uh, nucleotides in a cancer to map those comprehensively. The first human genome, to give this, put this in perspective, was sequenced and the draft sequence published in 2001 and it cost over $3 billion and it took institutes across multiple countries, several continents in fact, to, to generate that one draft sequence. This machine that you can see up on the screen, made available since January 2014, can do that for 1,600 Australian dollars in three days. Now what that means is you take an esoteric example and you can democratize it. And all of a sudden it becomes accessible to, in principle, not just rare cancers, uh, not just cancer in rare examples, but to everybody in the community. The pace of change is absolutely phenomenal. It's super exponential. And the drops in prices are just as important because it means that it's accessible in a way to the community in a way that's never been possible before. It's estimated, I've heard an estimate to put this into perspective, that if you, if you had the same decrement in cost for this technology as you, if you had it for a Mac, an Apple Mac, which you bought in 2001, the $4,000 Apple Mac you bought in 2001 would be worth about 12 cents today in today's prices. So that's pretty impressive. The volume of data that's generated, it's hard to explain, but I think this is not a bad way of explaining it. And these are some figures about the national computational infrastructure, the Southern Hemisphere's most powerful supercomputer based in Canberra, which we are going to need to be able to handle the data that we'll be generating. This is the era of big science. It's a petascale computer. It's not a gigascale, it's not a terascale, it's a petascale computer. And I think the, the most fascinating figure in this particular um, in this particular slide is that th this power consumption, 1.6 to 2 megawatts of power. In the, in the UK, where they're tackling the 100,000 genomes project using this technology, they've built their data center over a mine shaft in Wales because the cold air coming up through the shaft saves them significant amounts of money in cooling the supercomputers required to process that data. Isn't that unbelievably cool? So what that means is we have the possibility of taking these fundamental concepts which are ancient in this third era of cancer where we can understand for the first time the genetic and therefore molecular circuitry that drives these cancers and to map it comprehensively. At least in principle we're in a, you know, something that is something we've never been able to handle before. And the question is how, do we, how are we going to use this in terms of treating the patients that come in through my clinic door? Well, Graham has described you know, the use of this information to connect the mutations we find in people's cancers to the cognate therapies that we can use. And these ex spectacular examples of PET responses in patients with incurable diseases. I remember Grant MacArthur coming into, um, walking down the, the, the corridors of the Peter McCallum Cancer Center. His face was a, was a light because he'd seen his first patient do that. It's, 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 it's hair-raisingly exciting, and the immunotherapies are no less exciting. But as you can see from this graph, 
the therapies don't seem to work in an enduring way. That's become clear. And people think of this as a failure of the whole process, that you know, molecular medicine, personalized medicine, it's all hype and hyperbole. We are five to six years old. We are five to six years old. And this is not a, this is not a technology or an approach which is transient, which is going to become outdated. We've just got to realize that we've got to build on these beginnings and work out where the barriers are to turning these anecdotal and small case series applied to some cancers and actually address the bulk of cancers. And this is, one, this is why I think rare cancers, the time has come to tackle this as a problem because what this technology is doing is taking, forgive me, I'll go back, is taking what we saw as an anatomic group of cancers, breast cancer, we've converted it into histological subtypes of cancer, and you can see the fractionation, and then we're breaking that down, even for the common cancers, into smaller and smaller subgroups. And what that's doing is leveling the playing field. It means that rare cancers, which previously we, we disregarded in effect because they were too small to tackle statistically with the clinical trials designs that we had, the tools that we have used to drive the changes that have resulted in improved survival, they've always been too difficult, but this technology effectively also democratizes the diseases. It means that rare cancers now are you know, getting comparable in scale and size to the more common cancers, and the drugs are working. So we know how the drugs, this is about reason. It isn't about guesswork and empirically waiting and randomly seeing whether something works. We can actually say we have a mutation in RAF and it occurs in a lung cancer, not just a melanoma, but in a lung cancer. What happens if we treat somebody with a lung cancer with a RAF mutation with these drugs? Well, the way in which we conduct those trials, I think one of the barriers that Graham alluded to is that our trials, which have served us so well, are still anchored in this tradition. And I think we need to consider more radical ways of doing this to expedite access for rare cancers uh, in particular to these trials. And I believe that can be done. I think that's a technical challenge that the only limitation is will and imagination. And I'm just going to show some data which drives me in terms of uh, my, about the scale of the problem and why this should be a top priority. This is a ranking of cancers in Australia from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare from most common in males to least common and from most common in females, breast down to least common. And you can see, for example, there are 15,000 odd prostate cancers and 12,000 new breast cancers every year in this country. Now I want to draw your attention to this other group. This is those things that include rare cancers and less common, what I call rare and neglected cancers. They're larger than any other group collectively than prostate cancer. And remember, these are just convenient classifications which are 150 years old and take no account of the modern era of molecular understanding of cancer. In females, there's another 9,000 cases, the second most common after breast cancer. But have a look at the effect on deaths, 5,900 deaths. The peak number of deaths in uh, males is lung cancer. It's more common as a cause of death than lung cancer. If you look at uh, females, it's more common than any other group. 5,000 deaths from these other cancers compared to the maximum is 2,600 for breast cancer. But if you look at the potential years of life lost, and this is a function of the age at which these cancers occur. These are diseases that affect young people. So their impact upon the community in terms of what we lose every year is much greater. 94,000 deaths, which is 30,000 more than lung cancer. And for female cancers, 66,000 years of life lost it's uh, compared to 48,900 for breast cancer. So let, let me recap. We have tackled this problem using anatomy and histology, and we've made enormous success, but we have left behind this group of Australians. And we don't need to, because the way in which we can reclassify cancers using this amazing technology which is emerging is now a, t a challenge not to science, but to our health systems and our ability to translate. And that's what I think where, where most of the activity should be going on now. And Graham made this point. So the treatments that we're applying in this situation are just too late. I mean, the miracle uh, changes, the, 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 the effects of these drugs are astonishing, but what we want to do is catch these cancers early. And so we've thought about cancers predominantly in terms of the disease themselves, but cancers don't arise uh, in an absence of a host. They arise within a person, and that person occurs within a, naturally a family, and our society is woven together of hundreds, thousands, millions of families, and each of those families transmits the genes from parent to child, and we can now map all of that, and we can work out in principle, although cancer occurs apparently randomly, everybody in this room, 
has a different risk of developing cancers, and some of us have a much higher risk than others. And in principle, we can use this genomic information to identify those people at risk and potentially then target social resources to those people who are at highest risk, who will benefit most from the interventions we have, and spare those who don't. Let me give you an example of that. So we use mammographic screening in our community to detect breast cancer early, and we know that saves lives. There's some debate about that, but I can tell you David Currow absolutely is convinced that, th that this intervention saves lives in our community by detecting breast cancers early when the surgeon's knife, William Halstead's operation, can cure people. We spend $120 million a year screening every woman every two years from the age of 50 and up. Now, it's true that a subset of those women have a very high risk of cancer, and we might think about shifting the age of screening earlier, and that's how we pr practice. But it's also possibly true that there are some women in our community who are never going to get breast cancer by virtue of having absolutely none of the risk factors that we identify. We could save the money from that investment, from investing in those women, and the, the burden that the, inter, that the screening imposes upon them and focuses upon those who are at greatest risk. That sort of nuancing means that from a social perspective, we need to think more creatively about the investments that we're, we're going to need to make. And it doesn't necessarily need to involve more money, it could involve more astute use of money. And I think that's a challenge, again, to the imagination. But familial cancer is a really big issue, as you can see. And this is, it's really, again, this principle about ancient themes. This paper um, I pulled out of the American Journal of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, Epidemiology, I think it was, in 1931, described a family affected by cancer. Um, originally described in 1911. This is a theme which is fundamental to cancer's development in our community. And it's certainly, I think, understanding these rare exceptions and the ability to intervene, as you can see here, for breast cancer. This is a screened population in survival in the UK compared to those who are not screened. That's a 20% improvement in survival because we can screen and detect these things early. How can we maximize the potential of this approach? I wanted to finish off just with, an, with a, a, a message about whether or not this is not scientific hyperbole and whether reason is a re, is, can, be re, can be linked to hope. All of us need hope. Patients with advanced disease who face cancer and are fighting for their lives need hope, in my view. And science is simply a reasoned hope. So this is a data from the UK that describes the improvements in survival for all cancers in the period from 1971 till around I think 2010. And what you can see is that science does result in improvements in survival. I believe that with accelerating knowledge and with exploration of all the potential opportunities of genomics in particular, in what is essentially a genetic disease, we can expect over the next 20 to 30 years to see that improve by the same amount. And you can see there's a massive improvement in many of these cancers but in fact, the challenge is now, from an epidemiologic or a social equity point of view, to take the rare cancers that assist, where the improvements of survival haven't occurred and take the low-hanging fruit of those patients and provide them with access to, this, to science and reasoned hope. And I think that's something that is not a, not a scientific question. It's a question that society needs to address uh, through partnership, through collaboration, through, uh, through working together to address this problem. Thank you.